Some of these clips are just much longer than I need. Good morning. Welcome to the Line by Line Bible Studies. Um, all right, hopefully we make it through this today because uh, I almost had to reschedule, and um, but I feel pretty good, so I think we'll give it a shot. So um, we are in verse 24. That song there was exactly matched up to what we studied yesterday. All right, um, here we go. So, I think I felt like 23 was mostly covered. God searches our reins and our hearts, our innermost, innermost who we are and what we are. The things that, like, I, sometimes that are even beyond our um, conscious control. You know, how many times have there been things where, like, you know, uh, you want to do. You, know, you, you, you want to do a particular action or what you see as right, but then you're confronted with a situation and you do not react the way you would intellectually. A lot of times I think uh, a good way to see this manifest is, is uh, angry things. A lot of times anger is based on some very powerful, deep emotions like fear, injustice, and that uh, flaming of anger or rage is very difficult to get a handle on. Anyways, I think we did cover it. I'll give to you, every one of you according to your works. You know, when God does not deal with us on the basis of grace, He gives us according to our works. I mean, I don't know. If you look at like the Church of Smyrna, there's no I will give you according to your works. So he says, I'll give you a crown of life. I'll give you a crown of life. I'll tell you what, my works don't add up to a crown of life. You know? Even all the best things I've ever done. They don't like tally it all up and, and oh look at that what'd you how many, you know, all the points you scored, Paul, what does it add up to? Life eternal. No. <laughs> There's ne never enough. If we're being dealt with on the basis of works, we're going to find ourselves wanting. Because we're never going to rise to the level of life eternal. We're always going to be short of that. You know? A pe you know, I, 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 the best I might do is... A peaceful death. The be the best of all people, you know. Oh, what about you know Grandma? And she was so sweet. She baked cookies and blah blah blah. And it's not like she didn't have a other life that you didn't know about. But well, you know, a peaceful death according to their works. That might be the best we can hope for. That's why grace is so important because. Crowns of life, you don't, there's nothing you're going to do in this world that's going to be like, you've got a crown of life coming. What'd you do? Save somebody's life? A human? What is it exactly you're going to do to warrant eternal life as a human? What, what, what is it I'm going to do? Something in this world that matters to God enough that he says, yeah. I'll do God some great favor where he owes it to me. No, I just, I owe you. When God gives us according to our, our works, it is fair. I would like to do a lot better than fair. Some people think if things could only be fair, then I would be happy. And they, they feel that things are not fair. And that's more of a, a question of equity. When they talk about fairness, they're saying, how does my outcome compare to someone else's outcome? Not how does my outcome... Uh, compared to an absolute standard of, of outcomes, meaning a like a baseline of all the you know uh, what is possible for a human to obtain, as far as a baseline of like uh, naked I came into the world and naked I go out. So 
what is it I can do in the meantime that will change any of that? They always look at their neighbor and they say, well, he has um, you know, two new cars and I've got one old car. Or even worse. Okay, so 24. But, it, but unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, or Thyatira, as I prefer, <laughs> as many as have not this doctrine, or they, you have some there that, um, this was Jezebel, right? Who teaches and seduces my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. So there's a, a, a literal view of that but there's also a sort of symbolic thing of you know there is literal fornication that goes on and it is very rampant in the church I mean you know I just remember you know I had a person I knew I'm not going to give specific information but someone in my life they got divorced and then they were they got after well their, their spouse divorced them and they weren't willing to be divorced right so they wasn't really Oh, was it their fault? It's always somebody's fault, and everyone it takes two cooperating to blow things, right? It's rare that one party is perfectly innocent. But anyways, they didn't want the divorce. They wanted to work it out. And uh, But the divorce came because there's nothing you can do about it. You know, if one person wants out, that's it. It's over. Uh, so... Oh... So the, the divorce came about, and a few weeks later, he's got a girlfriend, and they're going to, they meet at church, and they're going to church, and, you know, and then they're living together, and you know, I was like, what? You know, they get all religious, and all of a sudden, it's like, obviously not that religious. We're just going to live a while together, see how things go. You know, it's like, there should be some sort of, that should be considered heavily taboo for a Christian. But the world we live in has been so corrupted that, you know, that it's, parents will encourage young people to live together before they get married because, you know, I mean, I, I tell you what, I don't, <laughs> I don't rush into marriage either, necessarily. You don't have to rush into anything, you know, you'd be best be real careful about who you hit yourself to. Um, because the spiritual component fornication becomes a kind of a um, sort of a, a, a careless pursuit of worldly pleasures you know what I mean like it is you know it symbolizes all such things that, that are unmindful of God's ways and of the what we've been called to it's just like sort of a mindlessness of it and it's sort of a giving oneself over to pleasure to forbidden pleasures it is the most common forbidden pleasure that people will engage in. Give themselves over to fornication. As many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, as the, the adherents of this, you know, her and her children. Remember, it's talked about, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation and I will kill her children with death so I have like the, to know the depths of Satan you know it's, it's knowing the depths of Satan is one of those weird things where it's like you know it in as much as you're experiencing it you know it's like um, you know bring them out that we may know them there's different kinds of knowing. There's a cerebral knowing, and there's the experiential knowing. Like, do you know the feeling of, you know, the, the do you know the feeling of the frost against your skin, you know, the cold air? You know, it's a kind of a knowing. You know what it feels like, or what it's like, and it's not a question of like a like. What is the you know the cerebral part of that like? What does cold feel like? I mean, like, what's in a you know in a uh, concise sentence? You know what? 
What is cold exactly? What is it, the feeling? It's not so easy to describe if you think about it. You know, well, well, um, it's kind of like the opposite of hot. I mean, there's no, there's, you know, I mean, like without comparing it to other things and stuff, it's just to describe it is very difficult. It's something you just know because you've experienced it. There's other kind of knowing, which is uh, to intellectually know, like to know all kinds of facts about something, like um, like I could tell you about, you know, how to. I don't want to go to automotive right away. I could tell you how to, you know, change out your brake lines and rebuild your brakes. Some of my things I'm good at. I have a lot of knowledge about that. It's not just something you experience it's something you have to get in there and you have to know the, the details of how to do things and so they're not it's not like they're initiates of satan like i have been initiated into satan's deep deep secrets <laughs> you know what i mean like like he doesn't bring you in and teach you all kinds of interesting things i think that's that's a i guess i'm addressing it like this because i think it's like almost like this myth People think like, oh, I'll become a Satanist and Satan will teach me all his great uh, wisdom. Satan just is a user. You know, the depths of Satan is you get sucked into something and then you become a slave to it. And it has power over you and you are uh, a servant of sin. You know, like if, 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 if there's... You know, once they start pulling you in and involving your religion with sexual immorality and fornication and all that, and doing and you start doing things that you know, eating things sacrificed to idols, you know, sort of knowingly participating in idolatry, knowingly participating in licentious sexuality. You know, I mean, it can get, it can, you can get buried in that stuff. And it can just take you over. And then you are in the depths of Satan. And he's got you. That's what happens. When we go so far astray, we go away from God so far, we are in the depths of Satan. In the deep water from which we are not coming out. We'd be buried with him. <laughs> buried in, I was going to say, there's, there's buried in baptism, you're buried in fornication, buried in sins. It's not that God can't lift us out of such places, but there's a thing that in the New Testament's very, uh, you know, when we, when we knowingly, when we have the truth and we knowingly turn from it, I'm not talking just to a sin, but to give ourselves over to sinful ways. Especially such things as idolatry and fornication. As they speak, I will put upon you none of their burden, but that which you have, hold ready. Um, sorry, hold fast till I come. Uh, but what, so what he's saying is like, remember at the beginning of the church, they had a lot of good things going on. I know your works and your faith and your charity. There was all this good stuff. And it's weird because, like, how do you, like I said, it's like, I've, I've seen some churches, it's bizarre. Where they do, there's like, there's a lot of, like, good things, faith, charity, patience. Uh, they're, they're going about doing the things you ought to do. <laughs> but at the same time, they have such a depth of immorality and it's deep. And it's, I think they've just forgotten to care about that stuff. You know what I mean? Or they started to tell themselves, it doesn't matter. We have liberty. You know, God forgives us. The thing is, like, the, we take, when we take God's forgiveness for granted, we are in trouble. Because... <laughs> You know, it is so wonderful that God forgives us. He's forgiven our sins. You know, all of them. And, uh, but we can't allow that to, Satan will try to use that. To say, well then, it can't hurt to commit this sin. Uh, 
can't be hurt by it because um, you've been forgiven. And he will use it against you to seduce you. And he's saying, you have enough. Uh, you have faith, charity, pay. I, if, if, you, if you could just stay away from this doctrine, Jezebel and her children, I'm not, I, don't, I have no other burden to lay on you. So again, here we see within the midst of a church that is really bad, we have, like as he says later of Sardis, thou hast a few names even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. So even though the churches are going to have their places taken away, God doesn't judge whole churches ultimately. As far as... And, and this is also a thing that the problems can become localized. You know, like there's the whole church, right? But why do we have seven churches? Because seven stand for all, just like the seven trumpets will sign for stand for all signs. You know, seven will stand for all because it is a number, uh, at least prophetically, that's, that the idea is like seven is the complete number. Seven is enough to describe everything, at least prophetically and symbolically. And so the this um, within the midst of the whole church, you have these localities and they fall prey to different problems. Or not even, even it can also be not even physical localities, but the kind of thing you're caught up in and then um, when the other churches have their candlesticks removed out of their place it doesn't mean necessarily that the individuals who were part of that church are all cast out of God's house so to speak but it's saying the whole thing has been condemned but God still in the midst of that can save just as he saved Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah he can save out of Thyatira those who have been faithful who have not known the depths of Satan. All right, and he, he admonishes them to hold fast. Oh, I'm starting to feel nauseous. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works to the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Let me take a sip of water. One second. Alright. One second. This is what I was worried about having to cancel. Alright. I'm just waiting for the pain to go away. A little bit. Okay, there we go. I feel better now. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works to the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken in shivers. Even as I received of my father, and I would give him the morning star. <laughs> so he then would come and keepeth my works to the end. See, they had his works in Thyatira, but and this applies to all churches, but like we can go astray. And then there is, you know, the salvation of your souls is the end of your faith. Something Paul said. You know, they say all you gotta do to be saved is believe. Yeah, you gotta keep believing. And ultimately, you kind of gotta do the things your beliefs say you need to do. You know, and your faith will lead you in that direction, and God's Spirit will help you perform everything He wants. So don't like freak out about it you know it's like uh yes every man will give account of every idle word but you're not under wrath but under grace and say well paul he's calling us to such perfection it's like yes but you understand it's like there is a difference you know like do you really think that the only this church at the, the Thyatira, it was just like well they had everything perfect except they were fornicating and worshiping idols no i mean obviously there are other smaller things going on. Everyone's got smaller things going on in their lives. A little, you know, oh, he was a little too quick to anger, you know. They had patience. So what I'm saying is, like, people can have little faults. It's not going to be enough for God to start saying, hey, you know, this is, I've got to consider removing your candlestick out of your place. 
God knows our frame. He works with us. He helps us achieve all the things we want to achieve in him, all the things he has planned for us. But, oh boy, sorry. All right. And he that comes to keep my works to the end, to him like a power of the nations. If we want to obtain the crown, we have to keep his works to the end. That's the critical part. It's we got to keep it to the end, not just at the beginning we put our faith in him and then we walk away and have nothing more to do with him. I mean, this is something that gets reiterated. It's, it's bizarre to me how frequently in the New Testament, I, I mean, I teach the New Testament line by line. Maybe that's part of the problem is that too many scriptures, I think that is the problem, honestly. It's because they couple this sort of legalistic approach to the scriptures, which is the normal way humans would look at something like this. People, when they read something, they um, have this tendency to be like, let's take this literally. And uh, like if we have a verse here, it says, uh, like Romans 10 uh, to 9. If you confess with your lips to the Lord Jesus and, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And they say, okay, that's what that, that says that. And, and that becomes an immutable monument of truth, which no other scripture can modify or otherwise give us further insight into salvation, because that is all the insight to salvation you are ever going to need. You just got to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and uh, confess him with your lips. That's it. And that is what they do is they take that and then they come to a scripture like this and they say, well, we've got to explain this away. And, and one of the ways that is done is that they say that, well, the seven churches are not the church. Really? It was like, well, there, there was, it's speaking to the time after the rapture when God doesn't deal with everyone based on grace anymore, but based on, uh, based on works if that's the case then nobody in the tribulation is going to get saved because by works you can't be justified you're not going to be justified by your works even in the great tribulation like if even if i give my body to be burned what, what does that mean i i i oh, i know i deserve to live forever because i stepped in for another fallible human i, I don't know or like it's not so much of, of the question of deserving because that's all relative. The question is like, what what moves God? What's what am I going to do that's going to move Him? That He moves me. That's the truth of it. And His grace comes down on me and moves me. So this doesn't you know, keeping His works in doesn't negate the grace of God. But the grace of God is given that we may endure to the end. It's not to, to, and to tell people that, it, well, you know, you don't have to worry about enduring to the end because once you put your faith in Him, faith in Him, you're invincible. There's, I, I go through the, so many scriptures in the, in the New Testament where it's just it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It can't be so. Sorry, I'm not feeling well. I think we'll make it to the end, but uh, I'll be limping over the finish line. All right. And so when we keep his works then he gives us power over the nations. Like this is power over the nations to rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken in shivers. It's pretty brutal. Iron you know uh, is not particularly flexible, especially iron. If you talk about steel, has a little more flexibility, but something that's just iron. And that's why it symbolizes an iron rod means a, a, a something that is sort of fixed. It's not particularly flexible. It's hard. Stern. Ruling with a rod of iron is a symbol of a an absolute reign. An absolute dominion. This is what I'm saying. It's like, this is why, like, I when I talk about conspiracy theories, I'm very unimpressed. Like, why should I be? This is what I believe in. I believe that 
through overcoming, it's not a question of like, is this my ambition or this isn't why I, I became a Christian. Okay. I didn't become a Christian because I wanted to rule the nations with a rod of iron. I, I did it because I was uh, actually generally just, I wanted to know God. If there's a God I wanted to know about, it seemed like this, like if you wanted to pick a subject to like spend your life trying to investigate, you know, wouldn't it be the fundamental nature of reality? Like find out, it's like, or, or is it going to be like, you know, um, you know, the thing about the ways we spend our lives, the things we invest ourselves into, it's like, and some people, for them, it's kind of foolishness because they say, well, you can't really know. You need faith and all that stuff and it, it, you know, because you don't have all the facts. I don't have all the facts. But, you know, in the, in the, but in the event that even any of the facts are available to me or any of the truth, it, it, it bears, it's worth going after and, and finding out. I should fail and stop. All right. So, it, you know, pursuing the things of God is a high calling that is... Sorry, I'm not feeling well. It's worth it. But it's not the... Re, but this whole ruling with the rod of iron, maybe that's not why I started out, but it's like it's part of the package. It's been given power over the nations. This is what people want in the world. They want, you know, what are people fighting over in politics? Who can get power? What are the new world order? What are they after? They want to take power over all the nations. You know, they want to rule us with a rod of iron. And, uh, and to some degree, I do believe they're going to succeed at some point through Antichrist. I don't know if otherwise they will succeed... I mean, like the Roman Empire ruled the world, but not the whole world, obviously. There's never been a truly global empire. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? As the vessels of a potter shall be broken and shivered. Well, that kind of that signifies the breaking up of the nations. I need to stop drinking coffee just right now. Which I that bad feeling was followed by a sip of coffee. Was that bad feeling followed a sip of coffee? Sorry. I just feel like I'm losing a bit here. So got, Jesus received this of God the Father that he would rule the nations with a rod of iron. And he gives us also this power. We will reign with him. That's a, an amazing thing. But it's like, it's one of the reasons why, like I said, it's like the conspiracies of the elite and the globalists and all this stuff. Their success is going to be very short-lived. Even now, if you look around you in the world, the, 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 the current that was drawing us towards a global world order is literally falling apart. Um... And, uh, you know, that doesn't say that something couldn't come about to restore it, but it's like nobody believes in these things. Like, people don't want it. Except for just some elites and stuff, you know. And they ultimately don't have power. They have less power than they ever did in the past. When they could command, you know, in the ancient times, people who had power could sort of command it more absolutely. Now they rely on things like elections and stuff. The most powerful men in the world are all elected. Well, you could say, well, there are some who are not like the billionaires behind the scenes. Even so, the people they pour their money into have to be elected. And that is a problem. And that's probably for the best. Okay, I will give him the morning star. The bright morning star. I, I That's mentioned again in chapter 22. I will give him the morning star. Oh, and then I finish it. I was thrown off by 
He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You notice previously it had been at the beginning of that, he that overcometh. This, this time it occurs at the end. Did I miss something? Well, okay, give him the morning. What's that mean? Well, the morning star is an interesting thing. Um, in the book of Isaiah, the king of Babylon, who is a type of the ultimate enemy, which is Satan, is called Lucifer, son of the morning, which is bright star, son of the dawn, or morning star. I believe the name is given there ironically, though. Because, but because that is how he saw himself. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. The morning star is the bright... It's Venus, usually. In the morning, you see... It's the star you see early in the morning or in the evening even, but you know um, they may not have known the difference. Like they not may not have known that it's the same thing. But when you see Venus in the morning, it's the morning star. It's bright because it's the planet, but it's much brighter than all the other stars, and it rises in the morning with the sun. But then it goes away because the sun comes out. So. That's what the morning star is, at least literally speaking. But symbolically, it's sort of, it, it rises with the dawn. It comes, when it come, comes early in the morning, right? Because one of the reasons you see Venus in the morning or in the evening is because, you know, later in the evening you can't see it because it's much closer to the sun than we are. So you see it rising in the morning. And, um... I think for the ancients, this symbolized a, like the king and the rising star. We have the same, exactly, this per, perfect example. We, have, we, we say someone is a rising star, right? They are, they are on their way up in the morning. They're rising. That's a good, that's a good analogy because like I will give you the rising star. I will make you a rising star in God's kingdom. And that's why I think that's, that's, that's a, encapsulates what I would try to say that kind of means. Jesus calls himself in chapter 22, I am the bright and morning star. And he is the bright and morning star. Because he, ab above all, he is the star ascendant. He is the one who is the star that is rising. His star is on the rise. You know, uh, meaning, you know, and, and this is a sort of metaphorical, symbolic idea. It's like a rising star. And so also, uh, we will become rising stars with him. Just It goes right along with what he's been saying in this he that overcometh statement. right? I will give him a rod of iron. He will rule with me. And I will give him the morning star. When you, the morning star is given to you, it, it, what it means is like you are set out. It it's marks you off as a rising star in, under him on, in his kingdom. That's, well, at least that's the interpretation that strikes me right here and now. Okay. I don't know if that's an absolute. I mean, it could just mean I'm giving you Jesus. But we already have Jesus. What, you know, the symbol that that represents, what, whatever, the symbolic representation of the morning star is going to be imparted to you. So whatever the morning star means, it's going to be part of what you have. I mean, just like it says, I will give him a, a rod of iron. You could say like, well, it says Jesus is the one with the rod of iron. Why, you know, yeah, exactly. But he's, but he's saying, I'm going to share with you the things that I have. And Jesus, as the bright and morning star, will share that also with us. Well, let's take a second. Before we go to the next chapter here, subscribe to Line by Line Bible Studies. Click on the like button. That's all linked in the description below. If you have a question, you can send it to questions at oraclesofgod.org. If you have a question about the study, you can leave it in the comments below or in the live chat. Let's look at the live chat. Has anyone had anything to say? No? Okay, fine. It's just fine. All right. Sorry, I'm so distracted today. That's just happened, like I said. I should have canceled. That's all right. We'll do a better job from the second half. I think. 
And to the angel of the church of Sar in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars. And things go back to the first chapter once again. The description given of him in chapter 1 is broken up into the seven churches, mentioning now the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest, and art dead. Well, that's one of the worst starts we've had yet. It's a far cry from, I know your works and your faith and your charity and your patience and your works. The last to be more than the first. Your last works are more than your first works. No, this one is like, yeah, you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. That's a, uh, that's not good. That can't be good. All right. You have a reputation for life, for being alive. Now that could be in many different ways, right? Because you could almost think of it as, as a liveliness or of eternal life or of having a living faith. but are dead. You know, one of the things Paul said, faith without works is dead. Not Paul, actually, James said it. Faith alone. Not by faith alone. That's what, the only time faith alone ever occurs in the Bible is when it says not by faith alone in James. Because what truly saves you is not faith, it is grace. It is by grace through faith. So faith is essentially part of it, just because this is, it's all in one, it's a cascading chain of things that are all interconnected. But the keystone of everything is God's grace towards us. And when God is gracious towards us, we have faith. And that faith persists. And not only does it persist, but it also, because it is not merely faith in ideas, but it is faith in ideas which have a motivating force to cause us to act. Yeah, I mean, the ideas that we believe in motivate us to do things. That's what faith in the Christian sense does. It is the, the, we believe in things that make us act, take action. And I don't know why anyone would deny this. I mean, you know, even in the places where they preach faith only, they'll talk about how people had faith and they gave up drugs and they gave up alcohol and they gave up uh, pornography and they get, you know, they do all this. They, 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 they throw off all their sins and they celebrate this as they should. How do they do that? Well, through faith, because they believe they should stop all those things. And it's the thing, you got to believe. The, but we can have faith. But faith without works is dead. We can have a dead faith. And you'll see that in this, that they really have nothing left, or very little left. Like, what? what is, your faith should build things up. You should have stuff. My faith has caused me to do all kinds of things that sort of define me as a Christian, like who I am what I am. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Let's hold on there. It's a very stern warning. Very simple warning, too. Look at your works are there's a problem with your works. I have not found them perfect. I think that's a hyperbole by understatement. You have a name that you live, you're dead. Your your Christianity is almost non existent. He doesn't even go into detail much. Remember how you have received and heard. 
You know what I mean? Like we receive things, we hear things, and we say, I believe it. We should act on that. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, I believe in Jesus, so I should probably go learn more about who he is. Right? I mean, or what he taught. Because I, I oh, I believe God raised him from the dead. And um, now I'm saved. And so what next? I guess I'll just go back to my regular life. I mean, what, what do you do with that information? You have to do something, or you ought to do something. Let's put it that way. And if you do nothing, if you do nothing as you ought, then in some level, it's like you haven't had proper respect to the things you said you believed in. You believe these great and marvelous things. So I believe in the Lord Jesus and that God raised him from the dead. You believe in the most... I, want, I don't want to say... One of the most... Um, just amazing miracles let's say that you could possibly claim that someone rose from the dead you say you believe in that but you don't want to do anything further to investigate what that's all about what's that all about because someone told you once you believe in that now you're saved and you don't, and there's nothing further to be done so like how I, I was never very convinced by that, honestly, as far as, and I know a lot of people that aren't, but at times you feel like that's, like, I get that, I, nobody ever really says that, okay, very few, gosh, this hurts, very few people say that, actually, will literally say, like, you don't have to do anything else, but it's sort of implied, is what I'm saying. Justification by faith. You're justified by faith, not by works. But that is not to say that there's no works to be done. It's not works to justify us. We're justified by the blood of Jesus. You know what I mean? I can't, I, just because I do right, that can't justify me. That's just what's expected of me. I can't be justified. I can't be made just. A sinful person like me can't be justified by works. I can't be justified by works. That's the thing. It's people understand. It's like, no, no, you're just not justified by works. Doesn't mean you ought not. Ought not what, what you can be done is condemned by not having any works. And might, you might say, well, I don't know, man. If if you, if not having works can condemn you, it sounds like doing the works justifies you. It doesn't justify what it does. Is it shows the Lord's work, ultimately. Ultimately, that, that's what it's doing. It's showing the Lord's work. That's why he says to them, I never knew you. Because there's an intimacy that exists between the believer and our Lord, which manifests itself in the works we do. Because it's part of, part of my relationship with God is him leading and guiding me into the works I ought to do. Right? And so... That is a that, so the works that go on between me and God, the things that change in my life and stuff. That is a important part about like me being instructed of Christ and sort of sitting at His feet as His student, and learning of Him and being um, faithful to Him as by hearing and seeking obedience and the power to actually perform those things. Let's see if I can change positions here. Oh boy! All right. Remember how you have received her. You've heard things. Hold them fast. You know, the, you, you, a lot of times people, like, we, we hear the word of God and we receive it with joy, but we've got to hold it fast. You know, like the uh, parable of the sower when it talks about the seed being going into the stony ground. It's like it had not depth of earth. The earth couldn't, it, it could, it could the, the, the roots didn't go deep enough because the soil was stony right we gotta let our put our faith put down deep roots in us deep roots hold fast you know what I mean that's why I focused in on that because the idea of hold fast if you will not watch I will come on you as a thief we were talking about first and second Thessalonians I mean Matthew you know, they have this book series or a movie called The Thief in the Night. 
It's all about the rapture. The rapture is nonsense. And if you don't believe me, go listen to my study on First and Second Thessalonians, or watch it, whatever. You don't want the Lord Jesus to come to you as a thief and steal you away. That's not what that's not what that metaphor refers to. That metaphor of a thief refers to someone who comes unexpectedly for destructive purposes. I'm going to come on you in a very unexpected and unpleasant way. Like a thief. Imagine you wake up and all your stuff has been taken away. That's what he's saying. Everything you think you had, it'll all be gone. You walk, you go downstairs, you, you, I guess if you live on a two-story home like I do, walk downstairs and everything you had is just poof, gone. All your goods are taken. All your valuables have been spirited away. And you walk down, you have nothing. It's a very dark thought from the Lord. You gotta watch. You gotta be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. Every and this goes for even if you're not in that bad, whatever you have, you want to continually be strengthening. So it says, add to your faith. What does adding to your faith do? It strengthens your faith. Virtue and do virtue not. You know, when you're adding things to your faith, and I'm quoting there from uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. It calls on us to add to our faith. Add your faith virtue to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance, brotherly kindness, etc. We're called to add these things. And when we add those things, we strengthen it. You know? We want to go from faith to faith, from a lesser faith to a greater faith. We want to go from lesser righteousness to greater righteousness. We want to be moving forward and upward and closer and closer to the image of the likeness of the fullness of Christ. Uh, okay, if you know, and you will not know at which hour I'll come. You won't be aware of when I'm coming. That's one of the things is that <laughs> we should be aware. No man knows the day or the hour, but honestly, when if you're alive and remain to the coming of the Lord, you should be somewhat expectant of him at that time, as you get close to the moment. You still won't know the precise moment. Anyone, no one will. But some people, but, but you will not be utterly ignorant. Like the world will totally not be expecting the Lord Jesus to come when he comes. All the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Now that says in verse 4, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Again, the whole church is not the, the horrible state of the church. And I think the fact that he says, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, indicates that some of the other churches where he does not mention that there are some there probably are. I always think that everywhere you're going to have people that are faithful to the Lord. Um, if only to bear witness to those who have gone wholesale away from him and abandoned him and not truly uh, been faithful to the things they have heard. They have not defiled their garments. The idea of defiled garments, as I was talking about this church, I was talking about faith and stuff. One of the parables I always point out is the parable of the wedding garments or the wedding feast, whatever, where um, the guy came in, you know, they, 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 eventually the king was getting all these people into the wedding. He finally settled on, well, just compel people to come in. And some dude came in not having on a wedding garment. And he was cast into outer darkness, right? He was very, uh, he was very, um, he was not treated well. Sorry. Very, uh, okay. He wasn't treated well. He was thrown out of the wedding. That's an analogy for when we, 
And what I say about that is that he was disrespectful in a sense. He did not have respect to the fact, I'm going to a wedding, so I should put on a wedding garment. And uh, and throughout the book, the book of Revelation, later on you'll see that the 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 um, like the bride, the lamb's wife, she is um, unto her was given that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Garments are used in an analogy. The clothing we put on. Uh, in a spiritual sense is symbolic of our righteousness. In fact, in the gospel armor, what is the righteousness? But it is the breastplate of righteousness. It's covering the most critical aspects of our body. It's a breastplate of righteousness. And, uh, and so... So when it says about they have not defiled their garments, it means they have not defiled their righteousness. You know, like, um, there's something we put on that makes us fit for God's kingdom. That means, like, we put on our wedding garment, so to speak, and now we're ready to go to the wedding feast, to the celebration. We're ready to take our place with Christ. In his throne, with the rod of iron, you know, we're ready to reign with him. We've got the clothes; we're ready. We're everything is appropriately set out. You know, that's it's a question of appropriateness and of you know having the right thing on. You know, it's like it's time to go to the party, and you're still in your bathrobe. You know, or you're just wearing street clothes. You put on when you go to a wedding; you're supposed to put on at least somewhat nice clothes. You dress up for the wedding. And we dress up for God's kingdom. Oh, boy. We dress up for God's kingdom. And what we dress up in is the righteousness of God, which, which is given to us. And we defile that by being inattentive to it. Oh, boy. If we're inattentive to God's righteousness, it can become defiled. You know, because we cared not for the things of God, we cared. We didn't look after the righteousness which was given to us. The, you know, I mean, the that He was uh, sending in our direction. Sorry. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Walk worthy of the calling where where into you have been called. You know, that's a scripture. Walk worthy of the calling. You are not worthy of God's salvation, but you can, through faith and through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you can walk worthy of it afterwards. And, and you know, honestly, there's a lot of things we do that aren't perfect, but one of the things you do is you count the things of God as worthy things. So I was saying, it's like not, it's not who cares about fornication, it's fornication is a sin. It's not who cares about, uh, you know, how you... Um, whatever, to handle some sinful aspect of life. It's like, no, it matters. Everything matters. All the righteousness of God matters. You know, it's like if I lose my temper unjustly or maybe even at all, you know, it's like, it's not like I just blow that off. It's like I did, I did wrong. I own my errors. I count the things of God as things worthy of my attention worthy of my um, my love and devotion okay they should walk with me in white white garments clean and white that goes right to Revelation 19 they've not defiled their garments I'm just like I said he's not very specific about Jezebel and all that it's much worse here it's just like there ain't hardly anything. It's very, you know, maybe just purely nominal. They kind of, well, I believe, you know, they still say they believe. Uh, that's about it. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. That's an allusion to the later chapter, the book of life. If your name is written in the book of life, you live. 
If your name is blotted out, blotting out, that sounds, you know, so sad that your name was written in the book of the living. I mean, the people who are alive. If you're alive, you're in the book of the living. That's why God is the God of the living and not of the dead. Because everyone who is written in that book is not going to be hurt of the second death. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. That was one of the early ones, right? And being blotted out of the book of life is a, sort of like a metaphor for the second death. Because to, like your name is written in the book of everyone who's alive and the idea that it's removed says, well, now you're not alive anymore. So if we are walk, if we, when we overcome, we are clothed in white, we're given this white garment. We're clothed in white raiment. And something that we both aspire to, like even now in the world, we aspire to when we appear on that day, that we will appear in white. And not that we shall appear, I mean, because like I can't get, you know, it's a, it's not a literal thing. Like I don't go down to the uh, uniform store and get my Jesus garments out and like, okay, I'm ready, Lord. I've got my garments on. I got my white linen. But it's something we have to sort of be worthy of. You know what I mean? And then we can walk with him in white. And the way we become worthy of it is just by being attentive to the faith. God will perform the works. You, know, you just got to keep, even when you're disappointed, even when it seems like things aren't working out, you just stick to it. So many people, the love of many wax cold. You know, and they become uh, unattentive to the things of God. They become careless of the things of God. And they drift off into sin and unrighteousness. And then the day arrives and they find themselves in garments that are filthy and then the, the Lord approaches them and says, how did you come hither not having on a wedding garment? And they will be speechless. I, I, I figured it would just be there. I don't know. They'll be speechless. They'll have nothing to say. And I will not blot out his name. I will confess his name before my father. He that denieth me before men, will I deny before my father? He that confesseth me before men, will I confess before my father? It's you know the antithesis of him saying, "I never knew you, Father. This is my servant. You. Your name. Insert your name here. That's what you want. Then the angels of heaven, angels of heaven. This is my servant. Fill in the blank with your name. That's what you want. All right, we're gonna wrap it up. That's good. We made it to the end, sort of." Sorry, I'm not feeling 100%. I thought we'd make it. We did sort of, but I just had a bit of a, I had the flu yesterday. I feel a lot better today, but uh, not as good as I'd hoped. All right, well, thank you for joining me in this study and for bearing with me. Uh, look forward to studying with you tomorrow. I'm certain I will feel much better.